And somehow or other, pilots have this, or a lot of pilots have this notion that that the airplane is safest right after it comes out of an annual inspection because it's been looked over really carefully and everything has to be right. And that's exactly the opposite of the truth. That is the most dangerous time. Hello again, and welcome to the Aviation News Talk podcast. I'm Max Truscott, and this is our weekly show dedicated to everything general aviation, such as news and safety tips for pilots and student pilots like you. Today, we'll be talking with author Mike Bush. He's the 2008 National Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year and founder of Savvy Aviation. Mike has written two new books on airplane ownership, and he'll be giving his tips for aircraft ownership. Now, last week in episode 146, we talked about WASP minimums, which you need to understand to fly GPS approaches. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out. And if you haven't already, please touch the subscribe button on whatever app you're listening to me on. That helps other people find the show, and it's the only way to get new episodes of Aviation News Talk to automatically download to your phone as soon as they're released. And it's free. So just take a moment, click on subscribe. And speaking of free, these episodes are totally free, though. Each one takes one to two days to produce, so I'd love if you join the just 3 to 4% of all listeners who support the show by donating via Patreon or PayPal each month via credit card. If you do find value in these shows, please go on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome or aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal, and show your support. Now here's our conversation with Mike Bush. Now let me tell you a little bit about Mike Bush. Mike was born in New York City and grew up in the Northeast. After majoring in math in college, he did graduate work in math and business, and soon after moved to the West Coast, where he's been ever since. After college, he worked in the computer industry as a software developer, and he managed major software development projects for corporations, including Computer Sciences Corporation, General Electric, Honeywell, NCR, Philips, and Visa. In 1995, he began working full-time in the aviation industry, and in that year, he co-founded avweb.com, which is a well-known aviation news website. He's also the founder of Savvy Aviation Inc., which is about to celebrate its 12th year in business, includes a concierge maintenance management program, a pre-buy management service, an engine monitor data analysis service, and a 24-7 fast response breakdown assistance service. Mike is also a longtime member of the technical staff of the Cessna Pilots Association and a prolific writer of articles on maintenance that have appeared in many GA magazines, including his monthly maintenance column, Savvy Maintenance, in AOPA's Pilot Magazine. And in recognition of his contributions to aviation, he was named the 2008 National Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year, an award presented to him by the FAA Administrator at EAA AirVenture in Oshkosh, And it was at that ceremony where Mike and I met for the first time. Mike, welcome back to Aviation News Talk. I'm excited to have you back. Well, I'm glad to be back, Max. I didn't realize that was the first time we met. It was. I was the 2008 National CFI of the Year. We were both at the awards ceremony. We uh, both were standing backstage there and had the administrator uh, talk with us, present our awards. So fun time. Yeah. Well, that brings back good memories. Indeed. It was great. Well, you and I are both doing what most of the people in the country are doing right now, assuming they're listening to this uh, not 10 years from now, and that is we are sheltering at home because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm kind of curious, I'm guessing there are pilots who are not flying their plane as often as they used to. Just kind of give us an idea what happens to an engine over time that isn't flown enough. Well, airplanes don't like not to fly, and engines particularly don't like not to fly. And you're right, Max, I was out flying my airplane a couple of days ago. And it's eerily quiet. You know, there's very little activity at the airport. There's very little activity on ATC frequency. It is is a little bit spooky. So clearly a lot of airplanes are are sitting unflown. Um, And the the big issue with with engines that are unflown is the risk of corrosion. Uh, And it's corrosion to ferrous metal parts that don't have a protective oil film being held captive against them. So, for example, we we don't worry about crankshafts corroding because the crankshaft journals have a film of oil being held against them by bearings and they can go a very, very long time and we never see any corrosion on crankshafts. The things we really worry about uh, in engines that are idle are the, the cam lobes, and the lifters and the cylinder walls. 
Now, if you get corrosion on cylinder walls, light corrosion is pretty common and it scrapes off when you next run the engine. It's not usually that big a deal. If the corrosion develops into serious pitting, the, the cylinder can start losing compression and so on. But, you know, if the worst comes to the worst, you wind up changing a cylinder. Cam and lifter corrosion is the stuff that is, is really a nightmare because the only solution to it is splitting the case. So it gets very expensive. And over what period of time would you expect something like this to become serious? It depends a lot on the environment. You know, an airplane can sit for a long time in Denver or Missoula, Montana or something. But if it's sitting in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or God help us, South Florida, uh, which is like the corrosion capital of the United States, a relatively small amount of inactivity, a month or two of being inactive, and, and bad things can start to develop. Uh, so in high corrosion environments, it's worth taking more active precautions against this if the airplane's going to be idle than it would if you if the airplane was based in a, in a place that, that that had a less corrosive atmosphere. Also, whether the airplane is stored outside or hangered makes a difference as well. So if people aren't going to be flying their plane a lot right now, what kinds of steps should they take to try and protect their engines? Well, there are really two things that you can do. The traditional way to protect an engine that, uh, during a period of disuse is what's called pickling the engine, or the official term for it is placing it in flyable storage. And both Continental and Lycoming have service bulletins that describe how to do it. But basically, it's a sort of a glorified oil change, actually. Everything involved in it is is stuff that, that is preventive maintenance that an owner can do themselves if they want to. But it basically consists of changing the oil and installing a special preservative oil. Shell makes a, something called Fluid 2F, not a very good marketing name. Phillips makes a much better named product called the Phillips Anti-Rust Oil. But these are, are oils that are specifically designed as preservative oils. And they're, they're, they're very sticky and they create a protective film that tends not to strip off over time or strips off very, very slowly compared to normal operating oils. So you basically do, do an oil change. Ideally, you go fly the airplane around the pattern once, but failing that, you can just do a do a good thorough run up to get all of the surfaces inside the engine thoroughly coated with this sticky oil. Uh, we've had a lot of inquiries, by the way, from from people in in Europe, like in France and stuff, where they're in they're in total lockdown. They're not even allowed to run their engines. <laughs> it's really a tough situation. And then after you coat the inside of the engine with this sticky preservative oil, you take out the top spark plugs, you replace them with dehydrator plugs, which are little plastic things that look like spark plugs, but they're fill, filled with desiccant crystals. And that absorbs any moisture that's in the cylinders. And there's going to be a lot of moisture in the cylinders because when you combust hydrocarbons, the, the, the primary end products of combustion are, are carbon dioxide and water. And the water, most of it is in the form of steam and it goes out the exhaust, but a fair amount of it stays inside the engine. So when, whenever you shut an engine down, there's tons of water in the cylinders and there's moisture in the crankcase and everything. You just can't get away from it because it comes from, from the combustion of, of avgas. It doesn't come from the environment. So you have to get rid of it somehow. So the pickling approach uses desiccant spark plugs and you put some little cloth bags of desiccant up the exhaust and intake and duct tape them over. And if you've done all that, you're basically done pickling it and the engine can sit for a year and nothing terrible will happen to it. Tannis makes a pickle kit or engine, engine preservation kit that you can buy an aircraft spruce. There's a four cylinder pickle kit and a six cylinder pickle kit. And it's got all the stuff that you need, the oil and the desiccant plugs and all of that stuff. The other approach which is a little higher tech approach, is to use an engine dehydrator that is a, basically a pump that pumps dry air into the engine. This is only an option if the, if the airplane is stored somewhere where there's AC power, that where you can plug one of these things into the wall. But there are a couple of different kinds of engine dehydrators you can buy. And you, you basically plug them in, you, you hook a 
tube from the engine dehydrator into the crankcase, either through the oil filler or, or through the breather, depending on what's the easiest way to, to get air into that particular engine installation. And it, it simply pumps a small volume of pre-dried, very, very low humidity air into the engine, displaces the moist air out of the engine and, conti- and, and keeps the crankcase with a slight positive pressure of this very dried air. And again, that prevents the corrosion by keeping the, keeping the moisture out of the engine. There are two different kinds of dehydrators you can buy. One has a little air pump that pumps air through a, a chamber of desiccant crystals, and you have to periodically go change the desiccant crystals when they turn color and have absorbed all the moisture they can. The other kind, which is a little bit more expensive, there's a unit called a Black Max. Uh, no relation to you, I presume. Not that I'm aware of. That um, is is actually it, it dehydrates the air through refrigeration. It's it's kind of like a little like a little air conditioning unit that refrigerates the air and 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 squeezes the water out that way, and then pumps this refrigerated cold dry air into the into the engine, and it's about five hundred bucks or something for the for the Black Max. So a, a, an engine dehydrator or a pickle kit are really the two good ways of preserving the, uh, an engine that you know is going to be in a state of disuse for some extended period of time. I'm curious, when you finally go to unpickle the engine, can you use that same oil or does that have to be changed out? The pickling oil is, is authorized as a flyaway oil, if you will, for up to 25 hours I wouldn't particularly recommend keeping it in the engine that long because it lacks a lot of the additives that normal operating oil has for keeping the engine clean. But you are allowed to fly with it. I just wouldn't fly with it any longer than necessary to get the airplane to someplace where you can change the oil back to a normal operating oil when you're done. Now, I know you're in touch with a lot of shops around the country and around the world in some cases. What's the impact of COVID-19 on maintenance shops? Are they still open? What's, what's going on? Well, it, again, it varies by region. We have um, a lot of sort of a hodgepodge of, of lockdown rules in this country right now, depending on what state you're in. And, and then there's sort of a hodgepodge of compliance <laughs> with those rules that, you know, people in the country tend to take this stuff a little less seriously than people in the city because the population density is lower. So we, we do have an awful lot of mechanics who are sheltering at home and not coming to work. And we do have a, quite a few shops that are, that are shuttered. And the shops that are still operating uh, tend to have very long backlogs as a result because we're, we're operating on a fraction of the capacity that, uh, you know, and plus during this time when people aren't flying, it's kind of a natural time for them to want to have their airplanes maintained because they're not flying. And the the maintenance uh, infrastructure is operating at a small fraction of its normal capacity because of all of this sheltering stuff. Well, and I would imagine that some pilots would then figure, well, I'm going to have to become my own mechanic. Where do pilots find the guidance as to what they can and cannot do on their airplane? Well, the, there's some regulatory guidance. The regulation, um, it, it's a uh, FAR 43.3 is what gives aircraft owners who are pilot rated the authority to perform preventive maintenance on their aircraft. And then there's something called Part 43, Appendix A, which has a list of about three dozen specific tasks that the FAA considers to be preventive maintenance. And there's quite a, quite, quite a lot of stuff on that on that list. Now, the Widespread belief is that only the things on that list are what owners are allowed to do. In fact, that's what the regulation says. <laughs> but interestingly enough, and I, I wrote a, an article about this, the FAA Office of General Counsel, the rulemaking division, wrote a letter of interpretation about 10 years ago that basically says, no, that list is exemplary. It's not exhaustive. So if you want to do something that isn't on the list, but it's of comparable difficulty to something that is on the list, you can go ahead and do it. The letter of interpretation came up in an interesting way. The CEO of Bombardier 
sent a letter to the FAA asking for a determination as to whether pilots were allowed to check the tire pressure on a a Lear, some some Lear jet that, that that has an air within its limitation requiring that the tire pressure be checked daily, and has exceptionally high tire pressure up in the two hundred plus psi range. And so the question was, are pilots allowed to do that tire pressure check? Checking tire pressure is not on the list, incidentally. <laughs> and the FAA uh, lawyers, in their infinite wisdom, came to the conclusion that 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 task was a preventive maintenance task, even though it's not on the list. So they said, if the if the Learjet is operating uh, part 91, the pilot is allowed to check the tire pressure. If the Learjet is operating part 135, it takes a mechanic to check the tire pressure. <laughs> As a result of this particular letter of interpretation, it basically says that the list is 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 an exemplary list, not an exclusive list, and that there are lots of other things that the FAA would consider preventive maintenance that aren't on this list of, of three dozen items. So it kind of opens up the door to owners doing lots of stuff that, that they can legitimately call preventive maintenance. There's a definition for of preventive maintenance in, in FAR 1.1 and the definitions, and it's a pretty broad definition an awful lot of stuff falls into into preventive maintenance well i know you have a breakdown assistance service so we talked about it two years ago when it was new then and what are you doing now that COVID is circling the world we actually made a an interesting decision because of the fact that people are having a hard time getting maintenance done that we decided to open up our breakdown assistance program and make it free for the next three months at least three months, we're going to sort of make a an on condition decision as to when to end end this period of freebie based on just how long this lockdown continues. But un- until the the maintenance infrastructure is, is is back to something approaching its normal health, we're offering this service, which we normally charge 150 bucks a year, and it's kind of it's like AAA for general aviation is what it is what it is. But we're offering it for free for at least a period of the next several months while people are locked down and having a problem. So if you're flying your airplane, you run into a problem and you have a hard time finding somebody to fix it, we've got a 24-7 hotline you can call. And within a maximum of 15 minutes, and it's usually more like five minutes, you'll get, you'll get a call back from one of our IAs and they'll walk through a troubleshooting exercise with you to try to determine exactly what's wrong. Then they'll walk through a an exercise with you to try to determine whether what's wrong is a safety of flight item or not, or whether it's okay to fly that way. And about half the time, it turns out that it's not a safety of flight item and that the best thing to do is to just fly home and deal with it later. And the other half of the time, it turns out that it's something that needs to be dealt with. And so we then take care of finding the necessary maintenance resources to get to get the airplane fixed while the owner either checks into a local Motel 6 or continues his trip up via alternate transportation, but we worry about getting the airplane fixed. So that's kind of that's kind of what the service is. And like I say, it's normally it's normally something we we charge 150 bucks a year for, but be, because of this COVID thing, we've decided we're going to do it for free for a while. Seems like the right thing to do. Well, how do people go ahead and sign up for that then if they'd like to do that? If you just go to uh, to our website at SavvyAviation.com, or actually, if you go to SavvyBreakdown.com, it takes you right to the right to the page. And you sign up for free. We don't ask you for a credit card or anything. There's no strings attached to this deal. We, we just need to know who, who you are, how to contact you, and something about your airplane, what you're flying. And once it gets into the system, then you can call. You get a, a hotline number, a toll-free number to call. And the toll-free number is actually answered by a 24-7 answering service uh, in Ohio. <laughs> and they type what you tell them into the computer and it talks to our server and it creates a trouble ticket and it sends a text message to the IA saying you need to contact this guy right away and help him out. And it's it all works pretty slick. You'll normally get a call back within about five minutes after you after you call the hotline and answer their their questions about where you are and what's wrong and stuff. Well, and I imagine you must have 
uh, rotating uh, on call duty for uh, staff people who uh, need to answer the well, not answer the phone. Yeah, but- that's, that's, that's exactly right. And and we we always have multiple IAs on staff so that if the first guy doesn't grab it within a minute, then it goes to the next guy. And but yeah, we do have we do have our we, we've got about thirty people working for the company, and about half of them are IAs, and we we do have them on a rotating on call schedule. That's good. I was worried you hand out your personal phone number. <laughs> well, my personal phone number is pretty well known, but, <laughs> but I'm not I'm not always the best guy to deal with this stuff. So, but we do have a pretty good system. I mean, we have about three thousand paying customers signed up for this service, and we're we're getting a bunch more who who are signing up for free, which is which is fine. I think that's it's um, just something that. We, we wanted to do for the for the community while we're going through a difficult time. Well, that's a nice thing to do, and it is a difficult time. Let's uh, go back to a, a more pleasant time, which was uh, two years ago. We had you back on in episode uh, 64. You had just brought out your Mike Bush on Engines book, and we talked about that. Mm. Two years later, you've been doing some other books. Tell us what you've written since then uh, in the book world. Well, uh, I, I now have two more books published, so it's a total of four. And this book writing project actually started about five years ago with my first book, which was Manifesto, which was kind of my philosophy book about maintenance. And it was supposed to be three books. It was supposed to be the Manifesto, which was the maintenance philosophy book. Then it was supposed to be one on engines. And that was supposed to be one on kind of airframes and avionics and everything else. So when I when I got the engine book done, which is I guess about the last time you talked, and then started working on the everything else book, outlined it and estimated the page count, and it looked like it was going to be about a thousand pages. You know, it's not really practical to do a thousand page paperback. It's, there's just some physical limitations <laughs> that make that difficult. So I decided that I was going to have to divide it into two volumes. And so uh, that what it became was uh, two books called Mike Bush on Aircraft Ownership or Airplane Ownership, Volume One and Volume Two. And each one of them is just a little over 500 pages long. They're both on Amazon. The Volume One was published last June, I believe. And Volume Two just came out in, in February, just a, a couple months ago. And so they're all available on Amazon. And now my latest project is turning all of those books into audiobooks, um, because nowadays a lot of people prefer to listen to books than to read them. And I happen to be one of those people. I'm an audiobook junkie, and I'm con- I go I go through two or three audiobooks a month. And so um, I decided I was going to turn the books into audiobooks, and I'm reading them myself as opposed to hiring a professional reader, because. I got a lot of feedback that people wanted to. It's sort of special when you when you get an audio book that's read by the author. I know that from my own experience. I mean, I there's so many books I can remember that I, that I read that were read by the author. Tony Blair's book was stands out. I I could listen to Tony Blair recite the alphabet. I mean, he's <laughs> such a spellbinding speaker. So anyway, I'm I'm recording the the books and I'm. I've started Manifesto, and I expect that the audio version of that will probably be complete in a couple months. And then I'm going to start to tackle the engine book, which is a monster. That, that's going to take a while. That's that's a that's a big project. Well, take us through a little bit of Volume 1. What are some of the kinds of things that you talk about in there? The Volume 1 sort of starts at the beginning of the aircraft ownership process, and it talks about how to, how to s- select an airplane and, and how to figure out what the right airplane for you is based on what your mission profile is going to be. Then talking about how to buy an airplane, all stuff about, about the, the pre-buy process and so on. Talk about insuring an airplane, all of the, the stuff that somebody who was a renter pilot and now wants to become an aircraft owner has to, has to wrestle with. And then we get into how, how to, how to pick a good mechanic and how to establish the right, kind of partnership working relationship with that mechanic because I'm a very strong believer that aircraft owners need to 
be very active in the decision making part, at least of the maintenance of their aircraft. The, you know, some some aircraft owners like to get hands on and swing wrenches on them, and that's great. But even if you if you aren't one of those people, it's important to for an aircraft owner to per- participate very actively in the decision making process with regard to maintenance. It's a concept that I call owner in command because it's sort of the parallel of pilot in command. When the airplane's in the air, you're pilot in command. When the airplane's on the ground, you're owner in command. And an awful lot of aircraft owners aren't owners in command and they sort of abdicate their responsibility to their mechanics and let mechanics make decisions for them. And I talk about the fact that mechanics inherently have different sets of motivations than aircraft owners. So if mechanics make decisions, they're not always going to be the decision that the owner is going to be most happy with. So it's really important for owners to be active in that decision-making process. And then we get into into troubleshooting and the art of, of troubleshooting and how important it is for the aircraft owners to be actively involved in troubleshooting because an awful lot of aircraft problems are ones that only happen when the airplane's in the air and they aren't, they can't be reproduced with the airplane in the maintenance hangar. So if the owner isn't in a position to, to do troubleshooting and to gather data and so on, then nobody can, you know, uh, an awful lot of problems. If you'd leave it up to the mechanic, he has to use guesswork because he can't reproduce the problem. So he can't troubleshoot in a systematic fashion. But as an aircraft owner, where, where you're actually seeing the problem in the air, the, you can do a very effective job of troubleshooting. So I talk a lot about that sort of stuff. I think that's sort of the breaking point where we get into volume two. I'm doing all this all from memory, Max, so forgive me if I, if I mess it up a little bit. But Well, let me ask you about volume two in a minute. I had a question here on volume one. I know in the book you talk a little bit about how important post-maintenance test flights are, and I think that's kind of a subject of, of great mystery to uh, to most pilots. Could tell us a little bit about uh, the post-maintenance test flight. And if, also, if you have any stories that related to that, uh, tell us those too. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Do I ever have stories about that? Well, I mean, the really important thing to understand is that the first flight after maintenance is always the time of greatest risk of having a mechanical problem. And the more invasive the maintenance, the higher the risk. But any time, I mean, even after an oil change, there, there's a risk. The problem is that any time a mechanic takes something apart and puts it back together, there's always a risk that it didn't go back together correctly. And the time you're going to find that out is the first flight after maintenance. So it always just concerns the heck out of me when when one of my clients picks up his airplane after a, 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 a big annual inspection and loads his wife, his kids, and his dogs into it and, and heads to the Bahamas. I mean, that's just not a smart thing to do. You have to do a post-maintenance test flight. It should be solo, <laughs> no passengers. It should be day VFR. It should be in the close environment to the airport. So if something goes wrong, you can put the airplane back down again readily. Uh, does not want to be over water or something like that. And most importantly, it, it has to be done with a test pilot's mindset, with with sort of this conviction that something is going to go wrong on this flight. And the purpose is to figure out wh- what it is. And somehow or other, pilots have this, or a lot of pilots have this notion that that the airplane is safest right after it comes out of an annual inspection because it's been looked over really carefully and everything has to be right. And that's exactly the opposite of the truth. That is the most dangerous time. I had a, a, a case, well, a client of mine was trying to buy a, a, a Bonanza. I think it was an F-33 Bonanza. And um, the Bonanza, while they were, while he was negotiating with the seller on this Bonanza, the Bonanza had a, a minor prop strike. I, I think the prop ran into a orange cone or something like that. And as a result, the the engine went through a teardown and the propeller either got replaced or, or got new blades put on it. And the engine came back from the shop and got hung on the airplane and the prop governor went on and the prop went on and the owner was called and said, okay, the airplane's back together again. 
So the this is the not my client because my client was trying to buy this airplane. It was the guy who was trying to sell the airplane. And he was about 50 years old. So he gets in the airplane with his 43-year-old girlfriend and the girlfriend's young child. And they go f- fly f- off for a $100 hamburger. And the, the airplane was based in Seattle. And they decided they were going to go to to Friday Harbor to get a $100 hamburger. I've been to Friday Harbor. It's a very nice place to get a $100 hamburger. But it involves a considerable flight over water to get there. So they, they take off. They climb up to 6,000 feet to top Whidbey uh, Naval Air Station airspace. And then they start a descent heading for Friday Harbor. And uh, the prop goes into overspeed. And the guy can't control it. And he pulls back the prop control. Doesn't have any effect. And he starts trying to throttle back to control this overspeed. And then there's this loud bang and oil starts covering the windshield and it becomes quite apparent he's not going to be able to make Friday Harbor. And so he heads for a, a little airstrip on a little island that's that was halfway between Whidbey and Friday Harbor. He doesn't make the airstrip. He puts it down on a road. They all walked away with just like minor cuts and scratches. It was amazing. But the airplane got, got totaled. And it's just like... What thought process? Oh, oh, and it was it's funny because the 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 local paper on this on this little island that comes out once a week had this article quoting the local sheriff about how this pilot's remarkable skill averted a tragedy. And, and I have to admit that if you look at where he put the airplane down, it was very hilly and had power lines, and he did a good job putting this airplane down. But what was he thinking? Taking off on this flight with his girlfriend and her kid, you know, over water and everything. It, it, it's just a total lack of understanding of the of the risks involved. You just don't do that. And it happens all the time. And I know exactly why the prop went into overspeed, too, because it's a very common situation on Continental engines that if the mechanic installs the prop governor and he doesn't get the splines on the prop governor shaft lined up just right, it damages the the prop governor drive gear in, inside the bevel the, the bevel gear that mates with a similar gear on the front of the crankshaft. And then typically about 15 minutes after takeoff, the, the, the tooth breaks off and the thing goes into overspeed. I've seen this so many times. It's just a it's just a a rookie mechanic mistake and it's amazing how often it happens. And if it happens, it's really nice to be over land somewhere near an airport where you can put it back down again. And it's really probably pretty nice not to have a whole bunch of passengers in the airplane. So that was a, an, another another story I remember along the same lines. I think it happened in close proximity to that first one was I got a call from a from a guy who owned a Mooney and he wanted my company to take over management of the maintenance of the Mooney. But he says, I I have to tell you that this Mooney hasn't flown in about two years. And I said, well, it's got to be a story behind that. So he starts to tell me the story. And turns out he he flew this Mooney to the Bahamas, to Nassau. And he hit something with the prop. There was something at the airport. I don't know what, what it was, but he had a prop strike. So he puts the airplane in the local shop in the at the airport at Nassau, Bahamas, and he calls his insurance company and his insurance company talks to the shop. And I don't know if they sent out an adjuster. I think they probably just did it over the phone. But the net result is they the, the insurance company issued the shop a check for like $25,000 to repair this Mooney. And because the shop sent the check to the, I mean, because the insurance company sent the check to the shop, the shop no longer had any incentive to to, to work on it very fast because they already got paid. So it, it sat around uh, in the back of the hangar for like a year in the Bahamas. And this poor owner who was living up in the Northeast was on the phone, you know, every every two weeks saying, what's the status of my airplane? And he would get a typical Bahamian, Bahamian response like, you know, it's going to be real soon now. And Mon... <laughs> And um, at any rate, about a year later, they call him and they say the airplane is back together and it's ready. They they ship the engine to Florida for a teardown and they they uh, shipped off the prop and they did a bunch of airframe work on it. So he 
gets an airline flight to the Bahamas and he jumps in this Mooney and he takes off heading for Fort Lauderdale, which is 160 nautical miles over o- open water. And a couple minutes into the flight, he realizes that the fuel pressure is way low. It's, it's, it's not in the green arc, that the engine is not producing anything close to full power, that the prop control is not controlling the prop properly and that the landing gear doesn't seem to have been fully retracted. So do you suppose he lands the airplane back at the Bahamas? No. (laughs) He flies it to Fort Lauderdale in this condition, over 160 nautical miles of open water. And by some miracle, he actually makes it, puts it in in a shop, a pretty good shop in Fort Lauderdale, where they spend the better part of a year trying to get the airplane fixed. I talked to the director of maintenance there, who is somebody I knew personally, and I'll never forget his comments. He, he, first of all, he used the, he used the term train wreck. That was his description. And then he said, I'm really glad it didn't fly over my house. <laughs> this airplane was, was, was definitely not, not even vaguely close to airworthy. And it took them a year to, to, to get it all sorted out. It turned out that there was some plastic debris lodged in, 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 in the fuel system that was restricting fuel flow. And, but nobody could figure out what the problem was. So they sent the engine out for another teardown, which in the tore it down. There wasn't anything wrong with it. And it, it ran fine on the stand, test stand, but it didn't run fine on the airplane. Finally, they figured out that there was some plastic lodged in some, in some fuel lines and stuff, but it was a real nightmare. But what possessed this guy to, he was so desperate to get his airplane back to, to the States. He was, because it had been imprisoned in the Bahamas for a year that it just all rational thought went out the window. And, but I see, I see people do this sort of thing a lot, maybe not to that extreme. I mean, that's a good story because of the 160 nautical miles of open water, but a lot of people just don't understand that the first flight after maintenance is the time you really have to be worried about going something wrong, doing, you know, something going wrong. Well, it sounds perfectly rational to me. He probably decided that rather than take it back to the shop, he'd prefer to ditch it in the water than to go back to that <laughs> shop again. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> You know, in volume one, you also talked about purchasing an airplane. And I'm sure there are a lot of listeners who would like to buy an airplane someday. And they've probably thought, well, hey, maybe if I can get just a really good deal on an older airplane, maybe that way I can afford a plane. Have you ever run into people who tried this and, you know. Oh, all the time. Oh, by the way, there's there's a there's a hot off the press story I'll, I will relate to you just because it's so it's so current. We do a lot of a lot of pre buys. And so we had a guy approach us, and this was just within the last week, that he was interested in in having us manage a pre-buy on a Cirrus SR20 that was advertised for sale by a, by a broker. And the price didn't seem plausible. It seemed like it was way below market. So the question is, well, what's wrong with this airplane? So we get, a, we get scans of the log books, and we look through them, and Everything looks pretty much in order. There's no big red flags. Doesn't it look like this airplane had a prop strike or any, you know, anything. But something just didn't feel right. So we got the end number of the airplane. We tracked down the owner of the airplane, and we were able to contact the owner of the airplane because we basically wanted to said, "What's the story about with this airplane?" And the owner said. Well, yeah, that's my airplane, but it's not up for sale. And no, I never heard of this broker. So it turns out the broker is a total scam that they were just, they just wanted to collect a deposit and, and, and run off into the sunset, which is something I'd never heard before. But that's something to really, really watch out for that, that it's n- nowadays when airplanes are listed for sale on the internet and all the, all the pictures and, and log books and everything are on the internet. Some enterprising person can collect this stuff and then represent himself as a broker selling an airplane when he when he has no relationship to the to the owner of the airplane and then the owner of the airplane is interested in selling it and can wind up you know scamming a, a a buyer out of out of a deposit so something to watch out for that was a brand new one on me Max <laughs> but uh, there are some bad people in the world but the, the, I I remember another story this was a while back of a a guy who came to me who 
was interested in buying a twin and he finds he finds an old Cessna 310 that's listed on eBay. I always get a little bit squeamish when I see an airplane listed on eBay, but it sure gets worse than that because the seller listed on eBay and says that this is a cash sale. He will only accept crisp hundred dollar bills and he, and he will not allow a pre buy to be done. So I counseled my, my client that he should, should not, that he, this is a guy who had a, a very nice single engine airplane, but he, he, he was kind of interested in getting a multi-engine rating and he and his friends were going to go in on this cheap Cessna 310. And I explained to him that even, that even if he got the airplane for free, this was just like a down payment on what was going to be an extremely expensive ownership experience. The airplane was based down in Baton Rouge, which is very high corrosion area. The Cessna built those airplanes with zero internal corrosion proofing. There's no zinc chromate or anything. It's just bare aluminum. So an airplane like that, that's, that's 40 or 50 years old and that lives in the, in the Southeast is typically going to be a mess. So anyway, any rate, he decided not to make a bid on the airplane, but somebody bought it. Somebody bought it for $150,000. Well, the key flag there, I think, was the pre-buy. I mean, what reputable seller would prevent a pre-buy? I mean, that, that almost suggests fraud right there. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've got a new initiative, Savvy AI FEVA 2.0. Love the name, by the way. Tell folks a little bit about what that means. Well, we, we pronounce it FEVA, not FEVA. Okay. F-E-V-A is an acronym for failing exhaust valve analysis or analytics, rather. And it's actually something we've been doing for, for quite a few years. One of the things my company does is we, we do a lot of engine monitor data analysis. And, and we created a very, very elaborate platform for doing that that's all web-based so that people can upload engine monitor data. And the system stores it and provides some very elaborate tools for, for graphing and analyzing it. And we, we actually offer that, all of that for free. Uh, but we also offer a paid service if they want to upload data and have our professional anal analysts look at the data and give them reports on it and diagnoses. And we've got some really fancy stuff we do. We send out report cards, for example, if a so let's let's say he let's say he's flying a um, bonanza. So he uploads his data, and if uh, if he uploads at least at least three flights worth of data, we will send him a report card that compares a whole bunch of of, of the engine monitor parameters with all of the other bonanzas that we have in our system, which is a lot. So that we, we're basically grading him on the curve. We're saying, here's how you're doing in terms of fuel efficiency compared to all the other bonanzas we follow. Here's, here's you know, here, here's how you're doing in terms of cylinder head temperature and, you know, oil pressure and so on compared to all the other bonanzas we follow. And it's really interesting. We have uh, about two and a half million flights of data in our database now which is like a massive amount of data. If you think about how many data points there are in a flight and two and a half million flights, we, we have billions of data points in our, in our database now. About 10,000 aircraft contributed to that two and a half million flights. So we have tons of Cirruses and tons of RVs and tons of Moonies and stuff all in, 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 in the database. So one of the things that we started doing not long after we developed this platform is to, to try to come up with algorithmic screens, the, the computer algorithms that would look at the data as it's being uploaded and try to flag anything bad that the computer could detect. And so we started off doing really easy stuff like flagging flights that had excessive cylinder head temperature and that sort of thing. And then I had noticed for many years that that frequently when a cylinder is developing um, an exhaust valve problem, you will start to see a small, slow rhythmic variation of, uh, of exhaust gas temperature. And it's a very distinctive pattern because it's very slow. It's typically like one cycle per minute. And it's a small variation. It's typically, you know, maybe 30 or 40 degrees out of a 1600 degree EGT. So it's a very tiny percentage variation. 
but it's it's fairly easy to detect. So we created some software to look for that pattern and to uh, alert us when somebody uploaded engine monitor data that had that kind of oscillation in the EGT. And we would alert them and, and say, you know, the, the our, our screen shows that you're at some risk for a burned exhaust valve. And we suggest that you stick a bore scope in cylinder number three and take a look at that valve. So we call this algorithm that we developed uh, FIVA, uh, Failing Exhaust Valve Analytics. And I wasn't completely thrilled with the performance of that it, that heuristic algorithm we came up with. Um, we, we did back test it on a bunch of data and we tried to fine tune it as best we could. But it still came up with a fair number of false positives where it would alert on a cylinder and then we'd look at it and it didn't look to us like it was really a bad exhaust valve. It looked more like, the, like, like there was just noise on the signal, that sort of thing. So about a year ago, we started looking at whether we could do better. And because we now have so much data in our database, we decided that we could start uh, applying machine learning techniques uh, to the problem where we would, we would create a trainable algorithm and we would just start running thousands of cases through it of known good valves and known bad valves and let it figure out what the algorithm ought to be as opposed to us writing code that that tried to duplicate what our human analysts would 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 be looking for it was an interesting project and lo and behold it turns out that the the new algorithm which we're calling FIVA 2.0 the machine learning version of it is a lot more accurate than the than the heuristic one we came up with and it's got a lot less false positives and the other neat thing about it is that Instead of being a binary thing that, that, that says, yes, this one looks like a problem or no, it doesn't, this algorithm comes out with a kind of a risk factor so that it, basically what, what comes out of this algorithm is here's a map of your cylinders and these three are at below average risk for having an exhaust valve problem. This one is in above average risk and it, it, it gives you a little bar graph of, of risk factors for the cylinders. and. Again, we always recommend if we see a cylinder that looks like it's at risk for an exhaust valve failure of putting a bore scope in because that's kind of the the gold standard of how you determine wh whether it's really at risk or not. But most people don't get their cylinders bore scope very often. At best, they typically get them bore scope once a year. The nice thing about the engine monitor is it's constantly looking every flight. And so it has the potential of of catching these problems a, a lot earlier. And exhaust valve failure is uh, is one of the major causes of, of power loss incidents. And if the exhaust valve fails just right, it can it can actually cause a, a catastrophic failure. Usually it doesn't, usually it just causes a power loss. And uh, particularly four cylinder engines, a failed exhaust valve creates a, a, a really big problem for the pilot. Um, Six cylinder engines will run acceptably well on five cylinders and get you to an airport, but a four cylinder engine doesn't worth run worth a crap on three cylinders. <laughs> so if you're flying a you know a Skyhawk or a, a Mooney with a with a four cylinder Lycoming or something and, and it swallows an exhaust valve, there's a, a pretty good likelihood you're gonna make an off airport port landing. So these things are pretty important to to catch these things before they before they get to failure. So we're really, really excited about this machine learning stuff. Um, and of course, you couldn't, we couldn't do machine learning to begin with because we didn't have enough data to, to train the algorithms. But now that we have all this data, it's, it's really, really working out very well. And so we're working on another algorithm right now that we've tentatively called SIVA, which is uh, for, for uh, stuck exhaust valve analytics, because that's the other, the other big exhaust valve problem. Uh, continentals tend to to burn their valves a lot. Lycomings tend to have problems with stuck exhaust valves. And the stuck exhaust valves will start off being fairly innocuous. They'll, they'll produce a little engine roughness at startup, which kind of goes away when the engine warms up. It's colloquially referred to as morning sickness. But if it isn't addressed 
and it and it and it gets worse, it can cause a stuck valve when the engine is producing power, and that can result in a burn a, a, a bent push rod and basically shutting down the cylinder. And if it's really stuck badly, it can result in a valve strike, which is where the piston comes up to the top of the stroke, but the valve hasn't closed, so the piston hits the valve and snaps off the the face of the valve. And if that thing gets lodged just right, it can shatter the piston and cause a catastrophic engine failure. So again, this is a condition that it's really important to detect it early and to act on it promptly so that it doesn't get bad enough to cause a problem. Actually, this SIVA problem looks to me as if it's a simpler one algorithmically than the burn valve problem. So we expect to be beta beta testing the, uh, the our first SIVA algorithm uh, within the next couple of months. Well, you're having way too much fun applying your software skills to these uh, traditional problems. It has been a lot of fun, yeah. you know, because because all of this machine learning stuff is relatively new technology. And it's stuff that, you know, I never learned when I was a software developer. It didn't exist. So it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, it is fun to take new tools, apply them to old problems. I realize now I didn't ask you about volume two of your aircraft ownership book. Tell us just a little bit about uh, the content of volume two. Well, um, volume two starts with a a pretty in-depth review of regulations that bear on aircraft maintenance. And this is an area where aircraft owners, well, they're typically trained as pilots. And, and so they know quite a bit about part 91 and operating flight rules. And they, they know quite a bit about part 61, which is you know, requirements for getting certificates and keeping them current, all that stuff. But they typically don't know very much about the maintenance side of regulations, which is mostly in part 43 and and part 65. And the maintenance regulations are really interesting because they're very short compared to like part 91. Part 43, which is the part of the regs called maintenance, has a grand total of 13 rules compared to hundreds and hundreds of rules in Part 91. But those 13 rules are very pithy. And parsing them and understanding exactly what they mean is a very interesting exercise. Most mechanics don't really understand Part 43, even though it's the part of the regs that governs what they do. A lot of FAA inspectors don't really even understand it. So the book starts off with, with, with going through the maintenance regulations and explaining exactly what they, what they mean and what, what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do and stuff. And it's, it's actually a lot more interesting than you would think a review of regulations would be because these, there's a lot of, of things like these letters of interpretation and stuff that explain what the FA really meant when it wrote <laughs> this. And so I go through a lot of, a, a lot of that background material to, to explain how, they, how what these regulations really mean and what they allow you to do and so on. Then I go into analysis of a bunch of different aircraft systems, um, get into tires and batteries and spark plugs and oleo struts, a whole bunch of different uh, turbocharging. And we just kind of dissect a, a whole bunch of different aircraft systems and talk about how they work and even more importantly how they fail and how you troubleshoot them when they when, when they're not working correctly and and so on on kind of a system by system basis there's a lot of troubleshooting stuff in 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 the book there's also a section in the book that is about flying stuff as opposed to maintenance stuff about how to fly efficiently what the what way of getting the most best fuel efficiency and the best compromises between fuel efficiency and speed and that sort of thing. Get I get fairly analytical about that stuff. There's something that Carl Carson speed that, that I go into that most people have never been taught about that uh, was developed by a professor of aeronautics at the, at the, at the Naval Academy, whose name was Professor Carson, of course, not Johnny Carson, but so there's quite a bit of there's quite a bit of stuff on on flying. I, I've got a chapter about twins. I, f- I fly a twin and uh, it talks about things like figuring out how much runway you need. Where you know for big iron they 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 tell you this. You've got something called a balance field length. But you're flying like twin, nobody gives you those things. They they give you kind of useless numbers like 
accelerate, stop and accelerate, go, none of which tell you what you really want to know, which is how much runway do I need today to be safe? So I get into how you can sort of come up with your own balance, feel length calculations and stuff. Then I sort of end the book up with a a kind of a look into the future. Um, The engine book ended with a look at future power plants, diesels and Fadex and stuff like that. And the, and the ownership book talks about some looks into the future, some of them optimistic looks and some of them not so optimistic looks. For example, I, I have a chapter on the looming mechanic shortage. And I did a lot of interviews with a whole bunch of directors of maintenance where they talk about their problems that they're having trying to hire competent uh, A&Ps now to work on general aviation airplanes. It's getting to be a huge problem. And I'm seeing a situation that's, that's going to come on us where it's going to be very, very hard to get our airplanes maintained just because there aren't going to be enough mechanics available to do it, which is um, probably one good argument for owners getting more hands on themselves because they're going to have a really hard time. They're going to be in a position where if they, if they need to get their oil changed at a, at a shop, you know, it may take them a month to get the airplane back and that's not going to be acceptable. So I think as a result, a lot more owners are going to start taking things like oil changes to their own hands, just out of necessity. That makes a heck of a lot of sense. Well, Mike, you are a wealth of knowledge and I know that you have a website that has tons of information on articles and links to past webinars and things like that. If people want to find out more about the art and science of uh, maintenance, where would you recommend they Uh, come out to find out more about you and your work. Our main website is SavvyAviation.com. And if you go there, it talks about, of course, all the stuff that we do, all the services we offer. But uh, one of the items on the main menu is, is an item called resources. And if you click on that, it will take you off to something called resources.savvyaviation.com. And that website has 10 years worth of my articles that I've written for AOPA Pilot and EAA Sport Aviation. It has over a hundred webinars. I do a a free maintenance webinar on the first Wednesday of every month that's hosted by EAA and sponsored by Aircraft Spruce. They're all captured in video. They're typically an hour and a half long each, and they're, uh, they're all available on the website. There's obviously links to the, to the books and Soon there will be links to the audio versions of the books and lots of other uh, stuff as well. Uh, we've got flight test profiles, which is the which are the maneuvers that we ask our clients to to fly in the airplane in order to capture them the diagnostically richest amount of engine monitor data when we're trying to analyze the condition of the engine by looking at engine monitor data. We ask them to fly a little twenty minute routine. Uh, usually at least before their annual inspection so that we can go through it and see if their mixture distribution is is okay see if their spark if their ignition systems are in good shape and all that kind of stuff so that, that's all on the site it's a, it's there, there's just a lot of really good stuff on the on the resources site i agree tons of stuff out there i absolutely love your your website mike thanks so much for joining us here today oh it's my pleasure max this is fun let's not let's not wait till two years to do it again. What do you say? Guaranteed. Thanks again. Okay. Well, Mike is clearly a thought leader in general aviation. And if you want to learn more about maintenance, you really should read his works. And I made it easy for you to do that. Just go into the show notes at aviationnewstalk.com or tap on the artwork of the podcast app that you're listening to now on your smartphone. And you'll find links there that will take you to Amazon and to each of his four books. I've also included links to the EAA webinars on YouTube and to his Savvy Aviation website. And if you have friends who you think ought to be listening to Mike and to our other 146 shows, please tell them about the Aviation News Talk podcast. And if they don't know what a podcast is, and lots of people don't, just send them out to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store because everyone knows how to download an app. Search in the App Store for Aviation News Talk and you'll find our dedicated apps for iOS and Android. Yes, and of course, those apps are free. And just a reminder, if you're loving this show, please go out right now before you forget and sign up to support the show via credit card. On the Patreon site, you can read about all the goodies that you can get at different support levels, including free books and online courses. And you can find that Patreon site at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, 
or go out to our PayPal site at aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. And there are links to both of those sites in our show notes. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.